We know there's going to be a warning. The warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign to me are, are one event. They're all so close. But we were told that um, the events would happen. It wasn't, the word coincide wasn't used, but it would happen around the time of a synod. And mm -hmm. I forget the exact mm -hmm. word right now, but it's so close it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But, but mm -hmm. the synod and the events have a correlation, is what I'm trying to say. The whole world is sick. Are you worried about America? I am. Believe the impossible and you can do the incredible. Let's do the deep dive into the miracle. Let's this do that. The miracle, it will coincide with an event in the church. On October 1st, 1961, <clears throat> a lady told something very important to Conchita. She said it had to do with a major church event. Now listen to this, where there would be the reunification of the Christians. So let's, let's get a little bit into that. We've had two major breaks. In, in the in unification we were never united with with Islam so it's obviously not Islam but the Eastern Rite and the Latin Rite of the Roman Rite broke off in 1054 and I researched this and was dumbfounded the official document was signed on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel July 16 1054. Mm. Whoa. So these are kind of a lot of this connecting type stuff that may or may not make sense. And again, because I don't make predictions on this, I'm only presenting data um, that I think is relevant. The description of a great event is an exaggerated but a poor translation of the original spoken by Conchita. It is incorrect to translate the phrase as a great event in the church. The actual phrase was, and then it's listed in Spanish, it can be translated a particular event slash an occurrence in the church or two, a specific event as a, an occurrence. So it could be a particular event or a specific, but it specifically doesn't say if it's a positive or negative, hmm. but we know the reunification of now of, of the church would be very, very positive in essence under one umbrella for unity. And the other was the Protestant Reformation, which I think it would be much more difficult for evangelicals to be united with the, with the Roman Rite or Latin Rite than the, than the Eastern Rite. I think it would be much more difficult for evangelicals. But something happened so profound that other, in, other entities, institutions, visionaries have talked about in essence, the, the, the act is so profound, everybody sees the truth of the sacramental life in the, in the Catholic Church as being authentic. Two, it will be the greatest miracle ever performed by Jesus for the world. It is supernatural and has never been seen before and will not be explained by science. Padre Pio saw the miracle before he died. He told people that, and he put great emphasis on, on Garabandal, and he met Conchita, and he broke some appointments to even see her when she was in San Giovanni Rotundo. And I forget, uh, what's the thing the Italian men wear on their head? I, I use the word doily. Um, uh, when they're buried, they they have this like little doily on their head. Do you know the Catholic, do you know the Italian name for that? I don't. He, uh, Padre Pio asked before he was buried that that be given to Conchita. Hmm. The reigning pope will see the great miracle from wherever he is. 
before the miracle, something will happen that will cause people to stop believing in Garabandal. Hmm. We've already seen we've already seen some of that. I have a section in the book called "Legitimate Areas of Concern and Confusion," and there are several. Uh, well, just to, to, to interject there, I mean that would seem to say that this that this lack of faith would have to pre precede the warning because I can't imagine when there's a prophecy of a warning and then it happens between that and the miracle, there would all of a sudden be this lack of faith unless somehow there is the greatest disinformation campaign ever to, to convince, and maybe this is very very much what happens, but to convince people that what happened was it can be explained away and some celestial event took place or whatever, and you're not crazy, blah, blah, blah. But it just seems like that how could you have a falling away from Garamandal if one of its most major things of the warning everyone would have experienced? So maybe it's before. Right before the warning. I, I think it's probably before. One of the areas that I address, even on a historical basis, is Joey Lomangino dying. That was a now, question two, I had. Everybody asked that question. I thought he was supposed to be alive to experience these things, and now he's dead. It's a legitimate area of concern and confusion. Yeah. The other is where mm -hmm. Conchita once said there'd be three popes, and then another time she said four popes. That's before, another question and, I have. El fin de los tiempos, the end of times. Now, I looked at that, and both of them could actually be right. That if you if you go back and look all the way from Paul the Sixth, um, who you know was the Pope at this time, it was John Paul. It was uh, John the Twenty Third who opened up the Second Vatican Council. But the Pope that was uh, was Paul the Sixth during this. And if you just count the popes all the way to the present day. Um, both of those could be right of whether or not it was, um, and one would only live a short time, was the prophecy. There'd be four more popes, and one would only live a short time, and then El fin de los, de los tiempos. It could have either been Benedict or Francis, because they could both be end-time popes. And it doesn't say it would be the end of the papacy. It just says it's specifically the... Um, um, there would be an event, uh, and then, then the end of time. So they could both be right that they're end time popes. Because, mm. you know, um, Benedict spoke about Tychonius, if you've ever read about him, uh, the fourth century uh, writer slash theologian that talked about, you know, uh, of how the, the institutional church would leave the faithful. Benedict was fascinated with Tychonius. He, he wrote on him 30 years before he died, and he also spoke on him, which I put in the book. He spoke on him um, just years before he died. It would be the institutional church that would leave the faithful, kind of a, almost like a double entendre conundrum of the way that you would think about a, apostasy or schism. So the next area would be the miracle of work. Now we're getting a little bit more specific. Um, but back to what would be a delay, Joey dying where people fell away. And Joey right now would be 94 if he's alive in, in 2024. And the other area is that Conchita said the people would not fall away due to the delay in time. It would be another, uh, other events. So people aren't falling away due, the, due to the delay. The miracle will occur on a Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Spanish time. Kind of specific. The miracle will happen bet between the dates of the 8th and the 16th, inclusive of March, April, May, or June. Now let's get back to some of the anecdotal stories. There is the story from Maria Sirocco that it, it, it's, in, it's in April. I think she said April now. As I said, she died in Pasadena. Um, I heard uh, Conchita say on Irish TV as a young woman, she said March, April, May, or June. Other times she said March, April, May, April, May, or June. So this gets back to why some people are confused. But I did hear, I have the VHS tape all the way back that I, I came about which I don't even have a VHS player anymore, but I heard her say March, April, May, or June to an Irish commentator because she had young kids and, and, and he commented that they were outside playing. 
Um, according to Mary Lowley, the miracle will take place within within one year after the warning, but this does not mean it has to happen in the same calendar year, but mm-hmm. it may, because some of these stories have come out. And story and information tends to leak over time. We know that of secrets being revealed. So it may be true and it may not, but I stuck with what they said. It will be on the feast of a young martyr of the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say mm-hmm. whether now in the definitive an- anthology of the Encyclopedia of Catholic Martyrs, if there is such a thing, how comprehensive is it? And how many young martyrs of the Eucharist have there been in 2000 years? And there's probably, especially on the Roman per- persecution and beyond, probably thousands. But I list some of the candidates for that, and there's one in particular that makes a lot more sense than others. And it doesn't say whether it's a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. It doesn't say. They say it will last about 15 minutes. It will be seen in the sky. This gets back to possibly St. Faustina, where you can see the cross and where Jesus, where the wounds of Jesus the rays of light, uh, rays will come out almost like a Shekinah glory or a Shekinah glory, more in English phonics. Um, and it would go to the whole world. So would it, and, and, and nobody could deny the spirituality of that. And, and science won't explain it. It will be possible to photograph and televise it, but not touch it. All those in the village and the surrounding mountains will see it. Now, here's a real biggie for people who have sick relatives, friends, in in any capacity of a loved one, all who are present in Garabandal will be healed. Think of that. You have Mother Angelica for 42 years wore braces. She was healed and she went to Garabandal to give thanks. Could you imagine bringing a child in, in a stretcher due to the love of the parent or, or relative on a stretch with spina bifida or something where everybody has ever known that there's a serious illness and then this person comes home cured. Who can say no? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if somebody has a loved one, they should stay with this and, and stay with the possible dates. And if March passes and nothing happens, then you're looking at April. You've got your passport ready. You're ready to go. I have every intention of being there. I think it's going to be the biggest show on earth. Or to put it yeah. in, in, in better have Hollywood. good connections to get up there. You got the helicopter oh, in. I mean, as you know, that's like one road in, one road out. It's like I think the part of the miracle is going to be people who can actually get there outside of maybe three thousand people. <laughs> After that, the town's full. You have to. Now that's the question because people say, "Well, the 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 pines where this miracle is going to be t- taking place." Um, it's an amphitheater, like you mentioned, geographically or top, topographically. And so if you're looking at it and you're not physically, let's say, in you know the, the, uh, the precinct of Garabantal, but you're somewhere surrounding it and you see it, uh, have, has Conchita or any of the others mentioned that, that they would experience the graces of the healing and the miracles from where they are? Or do you need to be physically like right in that town near the pine? Well, I quote Sergeant Joe Friday here from Dragnet. Just the facts, <laughs> just man. The just facts. the facts. It's just the facts. I don't speculate on that. Mm-hmm. If, if you know, mm-hmm. if you want to really look, if you can't get there for whatever reason, sickness, homebound, nobody to take you. And I, Mother Angelica, from my dining room table, told me when she came to Washington D.C. to speak at our week of prayer and fasting, literally told me in the middle of a meal that she was going to ask Conchita for a one-day jump in front of the eight days, so she could get a film crew there just for the reasons you just cited. In other words, you're on your way today. Book the first flight out, and you've now got a 24-hour jump. And anybody who ever knew Mother Angelica with her nerve and holy boldness would absolutely believe that story that she was going to do that. Now, did she ever ask Conchita? I have no idea. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it ever came out. I'm sure somebody must have asked that to them in an interview, you know. Yeah, Um, you know, no, I've been asked it. But the answer is, would it be God's mercy to do that? Yes. But yeah, nobody knows. But can I say that it was ever said? No. Yeah. Just, just the facts, man. 
Sinners and non-believers will be converted. The incredulous will believe. Russia will be converted after the miracle. Mm. And I always like um, what Fulton Sheen said, frankly, what the East lost through suffering, the West lost through affluence. Mm. And we're both collectively lost at the moment. And the United States is, frankly, a ship without a rudder, any moral rudder whatsoever. Conchita, who knows the date of the great miracle, will announce it to the world eight days in advance. Now, it's been asked, will that be enough time for people to get there? <clears throat> the answer is they're going to need to be prepared in advance. But the only people who are basically traditionally open to this message right now are, are Catholics. It's This is uh, a lot of evangelicals and really very, very good people. When you get to this sort of subject, it's too much for them. They gag. They choke to death when you start getting into Mary. It's just too much for them. I've been around it now my whole adult life. And they're very, very scriptural. They're very good people, but this is beyond the pale. Well, them. So, the, the so one caveat to that is, though, the warning will have already taken place, so they're going to have a new mindset. I think we're going to find a big shift that's right. that, that takes place after that, and they may be more enthusiastic than many Catholics are <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this stuff's real. Like, oh my, you know, I think that's, that's going to be the incredible part is to see what happens between the warning and the miracle, especially, I mean, obviously, the, the the amount of time lapse, I think, is a significant point, whether it's three months or nine months or whatever, because it's a lot of time in our in our age, unless God withholds the devil from actually having any kind of direct influence, like he does right now, um, and I know that there have been some mystics, you know, uh, out there who have shared their own uh, what they would say that what God has told them, saying that God will provide a period of time afterward for people to process it and make a choice, and then it would be a, ma a time of massive conversion before the devil's allowed to have influence back on uh, on the world. Um, but I think that it's uh, what an extraordinary time that's going to be leading up to the miracle, as if the warning wasn't, in, in a certain sense, a great miracle so it's, it's interesting to think if, if there if a lot of things still have haven't happened until the miracle there must be some kind of i want to say waning effect but a period of great grace and then a time of where the de the devil puts sows doubts in people i'm sort of like pharaoh he had 10 chances 10 chances he saw the the power of god and he like and he you know a lot of it he got dismissed, but then other ones, as they got more intense, he's like, he couldn't deny it, but the God allowed the hardening of his heart. So anyway, I often, that's always a mystery of like, how could the world experience this and not, and the world not converts because you still have free will. And I mean, the Antichrist hasn't even come, hasn't, or hasn't arisen yet. So that's like, I've seen it as my, from my perspective is in the timeline of things that the, uh, it's the final shifting of the of the chess boards and who's going to be on what side that after all of these graces have been given will be the, the climax of the battle that's my well i would go side. back to I, I would go back to what i said earlier what the blessed mother said and it was said actually also to father Gobi, the human mind in light of what you just said of why the world will flock to this, but it's going to be a new concept for them. They've never heard of Garabandal, but the, the, the graces are going to be preternatural. And the human mind is not capable of comprehending what God is going to do. There wasn't one person living anywhere in Egypt um, aware that what was going to happen with this deliverer, let my people go called Moses, and he was going to lead them out. Think of how many um, generations 400 years was. Let, let me, okay. let, let's just say a generation at that time, because childbearing, a lot of people got married at 15. So let's just put it at 17, 400 years divided by 17. 23. 23, yeah. Okay, that's where my mind was going. There, there was a decimal there. And so um, think, think of it, 23 generations. You've got a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and now go back another, an, another 20. 
Mm -hmm. We can't comprehend that. And yet their heart, their, even the people fell away. Nobody could have ever predicted this deliver that a sea would part and they would walk to the promised land. And there was a shorter route that the Jews could have gone. But Jesus wanted to, uh, God, Yahweh wanted to manifest his glory by going through this sea. Mm -hmm. if, for the Jewish people to have see what God had done. There was a shorter route to go. And frankly, it should have only been an 11-day journey that took 40 years. So they didn't quite catch on too quick. So, you know, uh, people are creatures of habit. So what will happen? I don't know. But we know that it's going to be more than we can comprehend. And it's a day of great, great grace. Now, Ted, on the, with the miracle having... <laughs> having experienced the world, having experienced the warning and then the miracle putting, uh, I guess even just looking at Garabandal is specifically, but then if you think of other, uh, apparitions, uh, since then, after that time will come a chastisement. Is that correct? If, if there's not the amendment of life, go back to the, if then, but there isn't, you know, w will it happen? I don't know. C mm -hmm. Could there be a chastisement based upon what was said? Yes. And I read the if then clause twice before. It could, there may be a chastisement if there isn't amendment. So how great will this grace be where people will make the change? I know many, many people who, um, have had great graces in their life in being creatures of habit, they've gone back to their own ways. I know one person in particular who experienced the warning, who frankly needs to have it again. <laughs> you know, oh, but he's, yeah. that, in, that individual was the sole exception of everybody I've ever spoken to mm -hmm. in the last 35 years of, of who's ever experienced it. It, it. it profoundly changed people. I know a man who had actually been taken to hell uh, he said he would have stepped on his own mother for uh, advancement financially. And he said there wasn't a single day left in the rest of his life since then that was ever the same since the warning. So, it, yeah, will it be profound? But before the miracle, <clears throat> Conchita said ab about this great supernatural event, before the miracle, there will be many reported apparitions throughout the world. She said this in December of 1962. And she said, a bishop of Santander will come along who will not believe at first, but will receive a sign and will allow priests to go to Garabandal for the miracle. That has actually happened to where a mass was said even by a bishop in 2012. Hmm. And oh. Monge, M-O-N-G-E, is very, very open for masses and everything to be said there. He's been the bishop from 2015 to present. And I think there's been a total, I forget it's in the book, there's been either six or seven bishops um, of Santander since the first one, including the first one. And they've had different levels of enthusiasm where one never condemned it, but wrote a letter to all of the bishops in Spain asking them not to believe it, but he never condemned it. So there's been different levels mm -hmm. on this with these people. Conchita will, as they say, announce it eight days in advance. Will that be enough time to get there? I think if heaven has set that date, heaven knows more about this than we do. So um, will it be enough time? Will it be enough emotional reconnaissance uh, on, on the data to get to this little place and be ready to go? I think heaven's going to give enough time. And then after the miracle is this thing called a permanent sign. It'll be supernatural a sign that will remain at the nine pines until the end of time. It will be possible to televise this, film it, and photograph it, but not touch it. It has been likened, now this is interesting, it's been likened to a column of smoke smoke or a ray of sunlight, sunlight but it is not either one. That's actually kind of interesting. Mm. She said, it, it, we know the Shekinah glory in Hebrew type, mm -hmm. you know, the Shekinah for us, which mm -hmm. was the pillar of smoke by day and a fire by night. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as long as they stayed on any right. of that, they were safe and their clothes never wore out and et cetera. 
and they were able to live and have enough provision to live physically. So we don't know what it is, but it, it seems to be like it. So mm. what could that be? It's never been seen before in the world, and science won't be able to explain it. And we know uh, Pope Paul VI, John Paul, Padre Pio, Mother Teresa, Mother Angelica all believed it, as well as many, many, many other cardinals and bishops th that I list some of them in the book. So the miracle is the, 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 the visible, the permanent visible supernatural sign is something distinct from the miracle, or is it the miracle that is just perpetuated now from that? Are they one and the same thing? I don't know. You're getting ahead of your skis there. <laughs> well, I, I mean, in the sense of the no, how, no, no. how how they no, saw no, it, no. how they saw no, it, because uh, a miracle takes place that's supernatural that everybody can go and televise it. Does that end and then it's replaced by a a permanent sign that is there, or is it the kind of the miracle is ends up being the permanent sign that people can then, you know, because that would be pretty significant as well, because then it's is does if you um, does that put a window on people then visiting Garibandal who are looking for let's say uh, healing and but oh I just not to be this is kind of my New Jersey side but be like oh I just missed the miracle <laughs> it just it just expired it went out like uh, two days ago but wait we have a permanent sign now and but I Let's guess we'll go. find out. Anyway, I'm just I, I I never really thought about if they are one and the same thing, um, because that would be I mean, either one is extraordinary, of course, but um, well, no, know. no, it's 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 an absolutely great question, and I'll give you my big fat answer. I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen I've never seen anything specifically that they are the same, and I always open it up. It may be. I mean, mm -hmm. God worked mm -hmm. ten miracles for Pharaoh. And each one increased in intensity and severity to get his attention. And even with the death of his own son, he still chased Moses with a hardened heart. And then it cost him uh, his life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or I'm not sure if he was at the front of that chariot, or, but we know a lot of people died in it. But uh, I don't know the answer to that. I've never seen any data specifically that they are the same. And for, okay. get, for me, for me to guess is valueless. Sure. And I just want to recap to make sure I understand, and maybe our, our viewers have the same question. Were you saying it was valid from some of the data points of those who were narrowing it down? I forget who said it, but um, let's see. Uh, I, I'm looking at. I'm looking at some notes that I had taken. I think it might have been from the Garbandal website. I'm not sure. Anyway, but it was talking about how the miracle would happen. It, it happened around the month of April or in April. Did you say that that was purely speculation, or was there data to kind of bottleneck things into that? Because my notes even say between the seventh and the seventeenth of the month, but not the seventh or the seventeenth. I don't know where that came from. Well, here, here's what I tried to do, and I went to great lengths in the book, maybe to the point of ad nauseum. I stuck with the original data because for me to go off into the wild blue yonder, picking daisies somewhere else and trying to make my narrative fit, I thought was disingenuous and wrong. Mm -hmm. So for me to be consistent, and, and I, I can tell you what many other people have said, many other mystics, because I, I know what they said, and I intentionally avoided it. Now, if I told you, let's say there's 10 of us at dinner, um, and, and there's a big table, and I tell you a story personally, and then you tell the story next to the person another hour later, and, and, and it all goes around the table. And by the time it gets to me, I'm, I'm the 11th person because it came from me. So it's been 10 or I'm the 10th person to hear what I originally said. We know from human nature that the story doesn't come back the same. And my concern with mixing and matching is everybody's trying to make their narratives fit where, frankly, there's gaps. There's, th there are gaps. It's like the book of Genesis where we were talking about signs. Before there were timepieces or anything else, literally in Genesis 1, 
God said he was going to communicate with people through signs in the heavens. Genesis 1. I mean, that's what they had to do. And that's why I do think this is very much a celestial event where everybody will see it in their own time zone. Whether it's light in, in the United States or in the West or whatever, you know, Spain is six hours ahead of us and, and it will be seen and felt and it will be simultaneous. Uh, planes will stop in the sky. So there's so many things that have been said, but, you know, whether or not these things fit clean, they don't. And so the thing of March, April, and May, I haven't personally seen the 7th and the 17th. I've just seen between the 8th and the 16th inclusive because those dates have been so clean without speculation. So my guts tell me that some other apparition or mystic said it was between the 7th and the 17th. That's my gut of how that evolved. But it has not ever been said specifically by the girls 60 years ago. Okay. Um, I, I have, this is, uh, I think your comment on this, um, th I think this is extremely significant. If this is indeed what was said, this was taken from an interview with Conchita on um, February 7th, 1974. So I was less than a, a month old when that happened. Um, and here's, <laughs> it, so now, now that I'm about to turn 50 next week, it's like, okay, uh, jumping ahead, but uh, half a century later. Um, but it says, uh, the question was this, you have said that the miracle of Garabandal will coincide with a great event with the church. Did Our Lady tell you what that event will be, and can you add anything to what you have already said about this matter? And then here's what Conchita allegedly said, according to this questionnaire from the February 7th. She says, yes, I know what the event is. It is a singular event in the church that happens very rarely, and has never happened in my lifetime. It is not new or stupendous, only rare, like a definition of a dogma, something like that in that it will affect the entire church. It will happen on the same day as the miracle, but not as a consequence of the miracle, only coincidentally. What are your thoughts on that? Is that true? Is that an actual quote from her? Um, is that Bishop? Is that the interview with Bishop Garmandia in New York City? You know, I, I don't know. I, I I made my own where notes you, where, from it. It's from February seventh, nineteen seventy four. So that we could, obviously I could we could look that up. Uh, but I've heard that before, and this goes back in the nineties. Um, this was uh, back when I was studying my undergraduate theology, and I remember um, Doctor Mark Miravalli alluding to that in light of, of course, at that time too, was the big, the big dogmatic movement for Mary's Mediatrics of All Graces. And I'm, I'm thinking of that, if, if indeed she's, if that's true, which she uses those words in the reference of a dogma, um, and then you mentioning too that there would be events that would be unifying for the whole church, um, that this could be, in my mind, is that could be one that would be very unifying and also necessary. Even Fulton Sheen said it was the only dogma that was left to be um, defined of on our Blessed Mother. And of course, since it re re it relates to grace and all of these events of the 20th century, 19th century, especially, um, are all the exhibition you can say or demonstration of Mary's the Mediatrics of all graces, um, and even some some apparitions being very specific about that title of Mary. That could this is is this a possibility that has ever been presented? Um, you know, of of a, a dogma like that. I mean, it, it I seems say like it is. I literally, without a prediction, I, I again presenting the data of because I did a film on that in 1997 with Mark, where Mark is the centerpiece called Key to the Triumph is the name of it. I saw that. Yeah, that's right. He probably showed it. He showed he probably Mark probably showed it in class and then ducked out. No, he didn't show it in class, but he did talk about it. And in 1997, was it 97? Oh no, that was 98. I went to Rome and he was there, and they had one of their Volks Popoli 
meetings in Rome at the Domus Maria, and uh, I happened to have traveled I was, out. I was, I was, I, I filmed that at Domus Maria in nineteen ninety seven. Oh well, <laughs> maybe I'm in it. <laughs> and, and then, and then my wife and I, we went back for the nineteen ninety eight because I didn't really see or hear much of it because yeah. I shot yeah. everybody in that documentary at that event. And okay. The film, the film crew that I used actually was uh, Pope John Paul II's film crew to do that for me. Okay. So and, is this know, is this something it's, it's, that is accurate? I mean, in the sense it, of like she used that word dogma. Well, it's like a dogma, which or like a, yeah, like a dogma. Which I mean, I don't know what else. Or that's a pretty specific word. Sort of like a a a, a, a um, segue question to that is also in light of the, this whole notion of the language she used of coinciding with a synod but before we get into that that was my my part two of that question is is because nobody talks about the possibility of a new dogma especially as there's more questions about the faith now than ever unless it's talking about a new pope that comes in who is in favor of it or everything changes after the warning especially if pope francis is still alive he will experience the warning too nobody talks about who's in this world of apparitions and things nobody even gives him the possibility of redemption which is very disturbing to me personally um maybe he could turn around after who who could not experience this and not have an opportunity to become you know from judas to saint peter you know they both denied Christ in their own respect. One became Pope and a saint, the other one hung himself. Well, you've just, you know, you've literally almost just articulated what could be a PhD thesis on this sort of theology. But uh, let's just unpack a little bit of that at a time. The answer is for a young girl like Conchita to use like a dogma. I got to tell you, if somebody had said to me at 12 or 13 or 14 years old, uh, use the word a dogma. I don't think I could have, you know, I'm making an incredible joke here, but the kind I, I, that's about as the possibility of me knowing even what a dogma would be, would be the same odds as me becoming an astronaut right now. <laughs> and so it's interesting. She used it. I did put in the book, the possibilities, the, the re reunification of the, the Eastern Rite as well as the Protestant church, which I think the whole world is going to, the Christian, the world is going to come under this magnificent brother, this umbrella, it's so big. But um, I also put that it's the possibility of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, advocate to where mm -hmm. she is crowned in heaven with this, which when, when Mark had been meeting with John Paul II, it had been Benedict who had said, to John Paul II to proclaim the dogma, impossible, Holy Father, impossible. Mm -hmm. And so it never, we all thought it would happen, but, but look at Francis, I'm gonna just use the word mercurial and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, you never know what this guy is gonna do. And I could say from a human nature standpoint, when all is lost, the child goes to the mother. That's right. And if you if you take a look at the situation in the world of what it could be, even post miracle it, a chastisement or fire falling from heaven, Akita, or whatever, <clears throat> or even some of the message here of Garabandal, I think the church is. If we look at what's true to form, they're going to act only at the very last minute because they don't tend to act when they should. Could you have ever imagined if the Catholic hierarchy and all of the bishops had united against abortion where we would be today? Had they ever spoken against it? And we wouldn't have the carnage that we see in our culture today because of it. So I think they're going to wait based upon all history, and it's going to be very late. But Conchita said it would be, it will happen. So the a, dog. A, a fifth Marian dogma? Um, no, the, the, the warning and the miracle. Oh, the, okay. The, the morning and the miracle. I okay. think the possibility of choices, it could be the fifth Marian dogma. And it could be from a very mer mercurial pope who you frankly never know what he will do. And if, the, mm -hmm. if, they're, mm -hmm. if, if we're all backed up against the wall with, with something that's so evil, it's, it's barely believable, I could see them doing it then. 
but I don't see them moving in, in times unless it's very stressful based upon history. They just simply, as a body of men, move too late. Yeah, it's like the consecration that Pope Francis did um, to uh, of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary right after the the war started, and which I think is an incredible event, regardless of what anybody thinks of it. I mean, it's pretty clear what he said and how he said it and all that other stuff. Um, but um, you know that that was. Some people think that that was the first time it was ever really done. I don't agree with that, but anyway. But what he did do, I think, was extremely a valid act, and it was very specific. And but it's like, well, the war started. Maybe we should have thought about, you know, doing just. I mean, I shouldn't say that he consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, right after he became Pope, within a year or two. You know, so it's like, like you're saying, it's very mercurial for every ten or twenty kind of, uh, you know. Um, questionable or you know challenging <laughs> challenging things how that he does how diplomatic he, peter how diplomatic <laughs> <laughs> i want to be very careful too because i always hold out you know i i really want to be careful about judging i'm not one of those that like pope bergoglio i have big issues with that but anyway um i just think though but it's interesting because if you look at what has what the holy spirit has done through the vicar of christ through pope francis is has been quite astonishing in the midst of these things like he still has made sure that we've had jubilees celebrated with graces that we just can't even imagine how many took advantage of that um from fatima to the divine mercy and saint year of saint joseph to then we have the consecration again i mean he's done a div he's done a, a number of things um that the holy spirit sort of has made sure has happened and we don't know quite what the graces of those are we really we don't really know um but you know, I just find it interesting because, like, the the, dog, the dogma question nobody really talks about, and then the other one is, and I correct me if I'm wrong because I think this is also the timing of the miracle, is this um, it, it will coincide with a synod, and everybody has talked about is that the right word? She's like, no, very clear. She's used the word synod or after us, right after a synod or something. No, didn't like that. no, no, nope, you got to correct that. Okay, um, correct me then, because that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, well, the um, uh, I, again, I put the warning and the miracle. Now, we've never, as as in essence, the same event because it's the same play. And it could be a short amount of time. It could be long. But according to just Garabandal, what was said there years and years, 61 years ago, is that it's, it's basically the same event, but it's about one year within one year. So to me, it doesn't make a difference whether it's after the warning. But the, the synod, which ends in October of 2024, it was originally two years, if you remember. Right. And then, right. It, then it was, it was, uh, and then it went out to three with the local. And we just had the continental last year in October, where they all sat around tables and, and 10 people per table. And then the next one is the universal. But the way it was said with Conchita to Sister Nieves in Burgo, Spain, when she was 16 years old, that the events would happen, didn't, not the word coincide, but it's still so close, it, it, it really, um, I don't think, makes mm -hmm. much difference mm -hmm. because I don't think a month or two. But I also think it's going to go way beyond that. And personally, I think more people are going to fall away because they think the warning and the miracle should happen the day after the synod ends. And we don't know what's going to happen. So it's the that, warning and the synod that people have been talking it's about. It's the miracle. It's, it would, after the, the warning, then the miracle Right. Uh, the events would happen after the synod. Okay. We, that that that's the uh, that's the way it was said. No, okay. let, let me go back. Let me let me go back. I'm, I think I just missed. Well, that puts us into like 2024, 2025 uh, okay. is the earliest. No, 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 no. Let me go back. Okay. Um, I think we. I, I was melding things. <laughs> um, we know there's going to be a warning. The warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign to me are, are one event. They're all so close. But we were told that um, the events would happen. It wasn't, the word coincide wasn't used, but it would happen around the time of a synod. And mm -hmm. I forget the exact mm -hmm. word right now, but it's so close it doesn't matter. 
Mm. But the mm. synod and the events have a correlation is what I'm trying to say. And I forget the exact wording on it now, frankly. Okay, so the synod, yeah, closeness. I mean, obviously, nobody likes, well, everybody likes to speculate. But in the sense of, so with the, with the synod concluding in October of 2024, with, with that openness of language, um, the warning could take place any time even now, between now and then, because that's pretty close. It is. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, I, I think, you know, but I don't think we've seen the Pope go to Moscow, which right. is a we have. And you're right. That's, we didn't talk about that. Can you comment on that? Well, the Pope going to Moscow is a very interesting thing, which I get into in the book. I have a friend um, who was a former seminarian for seven years and never stayed and never was ordained. And he said he uh, th the source of that is only from one person in the world. His name is Albrecht Weber. And he was, they say he's German, he's Austrian German. And he lived in Garabandal. He's a friend of Garabandal. He was devoted to Garabandal and he's buried in Garabandal. And in no way whatsoever would he ever want to harm anything to do with Garabandal. But he was... Um, he wrote a book called Garabandal, The Finger of God. And yet he, his first edition was in 1992. Um, and then he, uh, there's another edition in the year 2000. And not either of those editions in his book on Garabandal did he ever mention the Moscow prophecy, which I find not as odd, but bizarre. So did he show the... Um, his manuscript to one of the visionaries or something in 1992 or after in 2000, and they asked him not to put it in it. I don't know, but I find it bizarre that it's never mentioned and it's supposed to be a big part of it because we've known Francis wants to go to Moscow mm -hmm. and there was a great mm -hmm. deal of information on him going there and stopping and meeting with Kirill and he has a history with Kirill all the way back to 2016 in Havana and in other times talking with emissaries going back and forth, especially during the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia war where they were trying to get a meeting. And he had an, uh, the Pope had an emissary going back and forth to Kiev and then Moscow trying to get the meeting. So we know that, uh, Pope Francis used the refueling of the plane uh, in Moscow to meet with him. Uh, with Kirill, but it never happened. And his plane actually flew direct and didn't need refueling. Now, for the Pope to go to Mongolia, which if you look at it on Google and Wikipedia, it has a whopping 400, 1,415 Catholics. Now, in my parish church, there's that many people on a Sunday morning. So I believe the Pope used it as a pretense and the Pope had gone to the Russian embassy trying to get a meeting with him. He's wanted to meet with Kirill. He'd like to meet Putin and it's never happened. But the prophecy is from Albrecht Weber, only person is that he heard the day after the last apparition in November of 1965, it was set at the, the, the little dinette set in Conchita's home about that issue of the Pope going to Moscow. And then Europe would would run all over, uh, Russia would run all over Europe. Right. So that's, the, that's that part of it. But why would a person who, a person who loves Garabandal and devoted his life to Par Garabandal, frankly, like Barry Hanrad, he did in the United States, who he said he felt that was authentic, why would it have never been mentioned? So we know the Pope going to Moscow hasn't happened, which means immediately on the Pope's return, Russia would make some sort of movement going towards Europe. Eastern Europe and Europe. And we know through a lot of other Catholic prophecy that actually happens as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't get into that aspect of it. Okay. So w that's why I think we're still away. I don't think that these events have to happen exactly after a synod, but I think people will have it in their own mind. And it's another area that I personally think people will fall away because they're saying the synod's over. It hasn't happened. I'm not believing in this, and I can see that happening. Now, 
what about the uh, the date of I'm kind of going back and um, you mentioned this I think in the beginning uh, with the miracle is it true or not true that this whole notion of it takes place during an even year is that something that is valid or is did somebody just make that up um is it valid maybe uh, that the sole source of that is maria sirocco okay a very good a, a personal friend a friend of garabandal gave her life to garabandal i've spoken to her before a good woman articulate and a spokesperson almost like joey being called the blind apostle for Garabandal, Maria Sirocco did it also, but it, she's the source of that story that it's in an even numbered year. Okay, and, and is he I also? Can you, I can tell you the people in the village don't believe that story. Oh, okay. They don't. They, they, they don't believe that that Mary Lowley would have ever said that. Did she? Okay. I mean, did, on her second glass of wine, did she say it? I mean, <laughs> I don't. I, I I don't know. Is it part of a story that leaked? And that this is the part of stories that I call anecdotal, where, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which you just mentioned, somebody had said the 7th to the 17th. That's even the first time I've ever heard that, you know, and it's probably from some other visionary. And, and it's kind of right in the middle there because the 8th and the 16th are inclusive of those days. But in an even numbered year, maybe. Okay. And also I've heard in an even numbered year, uh, not both of the events would happen in the same year, same calendar year, an even numbered year in the same calendar year. I've heard that too. And I present that information, mm -hmm. but for me, I don't say it's true or not true. Hmm. Because yeah, Maybe. if you, if you put all those pieces together an even year in April between the days of, you know, including, uh, or eight, to the 16th, let's say, uh, on a feast of a, a young Eucharistic martyr. And somewhere else I had read about a name, uh, I think it was Conchita, or something, said that it was a name difficult to pronounce. Well, you can start going through the things and find the possibilities of things, especially if, it, and let's say it were supposed to happen in an even year. It's It almost becomes a little game of, oh, look, this is the possibility, or this doesn't happen again until you know, 2029, 20, or I've seen St. Stanislaw pop up uh, in the mix. Of <laughs> That's right. St. Stanislaw, St. Pancras, St. Hermenengel. Herm yeah, Hermenengel uh, something. Uh, another, another one that is kind of my favorite, and again, I present the data, is Blessed uh, Amelda Lambertini. Oh, uh, she's awesome. Uh, oh, <laughs> I love that little she, saint. She's the patron saint of first communicants. Um and th th everything fits the way you know she was she went to the bishop to receive to, if that she could receive the eucharist before she was allowed in the, in the 14th century and then all of a sudden when she was denied that the priest was giving communion to people and one of the communion hosts came out of his chalice and went on her tongue and she literally instantly died of pure joy she died of spiritual ecstasy. Exactly what happened with uh, Father Louis Andreu, where after he saw the miracle, he literally said, Milagro, Milagro, That's right. Milagro. Today is the happiest day of my life. And what happened? He died instantly. Today's the happiest day of my life, and he died. So blessed Imelda Lambertini <clears throat> is my front runner. But would she be considered a Eucharistic martyr? Well, look, look at it. She, she died receiving the Eucharist. I mean, you know, you have St. Pancras and Menengeld with people who are carrying the Eucharist um, in, in, uh, around there. They went to, uh, her Menengeld went to give um, communion to men who, who had been professed Christians and were going to be mur uh, martyred the next day. And uh, they wanted to receive communion, but they uh, they didn't know how to get it to him. So a little boy said they would never suspect me, uh, and he brought it to them. Uh, he was murdered, um, and so there's. But there's so many people that this could be Saint Stanislaus. The list is frankly endless, and it says little known. Now, when you're little known, 
and, and you know how many young people died um, as young people for their faith in the first 500 years of Rome. I mean, Rome officially fell as an empire in 434, but under what I call the brute Caesars and, 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 and leaders, they just murdered maybe millions throughout the world for their faith mm. because of the divine right of kings that Caesar felt that he held. They didn't want any competition. Hmm. So yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's been a parlor game. There's more of the parlor game trying to guess the date and the month, um, more so there, than trying to figure out a young Eucharistic martyr. Yeah. Very very difficult. Very difficult. And personally, it may not be any of the the common names, but when you hear it, you'll go, "Whoa, that works." <laughs> but my favorite is little blessed Imelda Lambertini. Well, we'll know eight days before. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing and we I do think, know, right? I, I think her feast day is May 13th, no less. Dying oh. at, at, at a, and there's there's some gaps in that historically. And, and she was also 13 years old. Interesting. Isn't it? But these, when, when you look at this, you see how God works. And, you know, everything fits. I mean, like we know if you were dropped from out of space as an alien and you read this book called the Old Testament and it was singularly there, um, you'd say, well, this is pointing to a Messiah. If you ever went through, his name will be Emmanuel. And you'd, you'd say there must be another half of this book. And then if you just read what's called the New Testament, um, who are these people? Moses, Jonah. Jacob, Zechariah, you know, and all of these Old Testament people, who are they? So you'd say, where's the other half of the book? Mm -hmm. So when you see these stories of, you know, Fatima and Akita and La Salette, and you know some of this, you see it's a very cohesive story. Mm -hmm. But it takes, some ed it takes some education to really understand how profound this story is, which is the reason I've always liked it. It's been my pet. Mm. And I've been to Medjugorje and I've been to uh, uh, four times and I've been to many of the other apparition sites in the world. But this is on another level. And I think it's got great significance also for the Jews being welcomed back in the church, who St. Bernard of Clairvaux, as well as St. Thomas Aquinas, spoke about an era like that. Mm. And there isn't a single Jew in the world who doesn't, he may not be orthodox or Hasidic or even believe it, but every single Jew understands the Shekinah glory of what it is. I remember even many years ago listening to a eulogy of, of, of President Yitzhak Rabin when he died, who had been the president of Israel. Um, his granddaughter um, gave, his, gave a part of the eulogy and she said something profound. She said, Grandfather, you are our, 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 our pillar of smoke by day and our fire by night. So she understood exactly what that was, you know, as a young girl. It looked like she was about 14 or 15 giving her grandfather's eulogy as a young girl. And she understood that. And so the, I think the Jews are actually going to be welcomed back into the faith and now is our elder brothers in the faith, and they're going to latch on to this in ways that are unimaginable. Hmm. It's so it, again, it's so profound. You can't you can't wrap your head around it. Yeah, my head's trying to wrap around it right now because I have uh, some interesting questions. And in, in like, well, I mean, we're basically at the end of our time here. Uh, but I know just looking forward to things, it's um, how everyone will know in the warning that God exists. They have to, I'm sure they'll have to know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Savior. Um, and they're going to understand like the key things. The church is the church that he founded and his mystical body. And they're going to, I think there would have to be these kinds of things so that people can make not just an awareness of their sins, but in light of the truth of who God is and, and our Lord. Um, and then uh, how many will convert through that? And this seems all before, I mean, I could be wrong. I, I could be very wrong, but it's, it, 
that this would all precede the rise of the Antichrist. So I kind of that's like my mind is uh, the next part, next <laughs> conversation is where does that all fit in? Because I think if the divine, my mind is this will, like I said before, will kind of arrange the chessboard for the for the end battle. You can say because every, not everybody will will keep it, um, even though they'll all get the same seed, like the parable of the seed. Um, is some might receive it with great joy and then shortly after the, the devil's at work and he'll discredit it and they'll go with him you know like they'll the first sign of whatever um and then uh we'll have to deal with divine chastisement and antichrist and a bunch of other things but we will all have been given a chance that's kind of how i see that how that's all going to work out, I don't know. But we're close. That's like a whole other thing is the whole Great Reset because that is the new world order that we're facing. That's still going to be in existence after this. And it's sort of like, you know, the Death Star is going to know that its plans of its destruction will be fully revealed. And it's not going to just go down. The devil's not going to go down until he's actually chained. So it's an exciting time. Uh, at least that's how I see the picture. Maybe you see something different. But what you've explained in Garibandal, I think, has been uh, uh, very illuminative uh, for our own prayerful consideration. If anything, get our, get our, like you said, get our lives right now with our Lord. Pray for an examination of conscience that really illuminates your conscience now. Like, God's not necessarily have to wait for the big warning. That's really for more than anything, I think— the obstinate unbelievers and a final chance for them and a great mercy for everyone who is trying. I think that they'll be kind of glad that they'll be able to see the things that they can't see. And the Lord's going to say, yeah, you need to adjust this. And this is our time to do that. Um, but to get our lives right now, don't wait, because I think there is going to be a time, and maybe Our Lady Medjugorje talks about this, but there will be a time when certain things happen, well, it will be too late. Like you're, that That's was right. your time. And then That's right. chastisement will come in, and you're going to wish that you had listened, because <laughs> there will be no confusion when God is acting. <laughs> well, you so, talked about the seeds. It, it, this also boils down to formation. <clears throat> People who have been following this in, in the way that you're articulating many of the historical parts, most don't know. I mean, one, you have a PhD in theology and you have an interest in this. That's not your average person in the pew. So you talk about the four seeds, thorny, rocky, fertile, and um, stomped down, tr trodden. And so three out of four of those are, are not fertile. So I do think a lot of people will fall away because they lack of a formation in their own faith. But some of the people who had no religious orientation that I spoke to, they really gravitated to it. It wasn't oil and water. They wanted to learn every single thing they could as fast as they could. So if where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, that's frankly what the divine reset is. The world's got the great reset. The Lord has the divine reset. And we're getting closer. We're not there yet. We don't see the fulfillment of prophecy yet. And I don't know what the events are that are going to catapult this to another level. But my guts tell me it's economic. And I found also from my history of economics, good people do bad things in bad economic times. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. something I think the trigger is going to be an economic event where chaos ensues and people start running for the exits. I think we're getting closer there. This country is right now living on borrowed time. We can't live. We're not sustainable with this model any longer of sin. Our our problems are not political. Our problems are moral. That's what's allowed this kind of thing. I 100% agree. Um, I want to close with, uh, I'd actually like to get your thought on this, not to open up something new, but some will say, I don't need to, like, all of this is interesting, but why is it really important? It's just essential to... Make sure I'm praying every day, and that's true. Keeping ourselves closed, I mean, living the messages, you can say. But why is it important for us as we leave this with this new, perhaps this is entirely new for some viewers, a new lens to look at the signs of our times? Why is it important to understand that? Because a lot of people say, I just can't, I can't handle them. 
one, and two, what can I feel powerless to really do much about them other than pray? So why should I care about what's going on with the World Economic Forum or a central, a di you know, uh, a, a digital central currency, central bank currency, um, or the BRICS, or make all the like, your economic things? Like, should I even be concerned about that because they seem so out of my control? That's that's a whole nother thing. Maybe we could do a a, a separate podcast on what mm -hmm. I call coping, mm -hmm. because the woman who read this book for me, who's very very bright and articulate, she literally, as I said in the first few minutes, of how hopeful she she felt after reading. These aren't my words. I'm a scribe. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't make these messages up. I'm just the person who put them together in a cohesive pattern. That's all I did here. So, you know, I didn't give one message that I said was from heaven. But coping is the next phase of this because she said she had felt great anxiety as a grandmother and mother in seeing her, her grandkids go off in, in places that they shouldn't be doing. And she said um, she felt great hope. And what she saw is God has a plan and it's going to be executed, and it's going to change the world. And um, th she saw the anxiety from the direction everything was going. And that, for me, is worth the price of admission. I have no control over what goes on in Ukraine and Russia, but I can tell you, and maybe we could get into a whole show on this alone, that what, what, we, what I can do... <clears throat> is what I know I'm supposed to do. My brother and I, we've really altered our diet. I went plant-based three years ago, and we've really altered our diets and feeling much, much better, um, et cetera. And my brother made a comment. He said, I know every single thing in the world about diet. It was a joke. What he was really saying and what he said is, I just need to do it. I need to stay away from sugar. I need to stay away from animal fat. I need to stay away from carbohydrates, and, uh, and, and I need to do the things, and we went plant-based. And so what, and my thing is I know what to do. I have zero influence over what happens in Israel, Hezbollah, Hamas, Persian Gulf, Yemen, or anywhere else. And frankly, I don't have much control over anything once I, once I put my foot on the sidewalk of what happens my own sidewalk, but I can get up. I can go to mass. We had our Seneca last night that's been meeting for 28 straight years with people, some coming and going, but mostly the same people for 28 years. It meets every Thursday night. There's the rosary. We do readings. There's the chaplet. And then, as I say, we pray for one hour and talk for two. <laughs> You know, and great friends, you know, and, and, and everybody prepares something and brings something. And it's the spice of life. But, you know, are we going to confession? Are we doing the things that we should be doing? That's the way to cope for the future. Mm -hmm. Control what we can. That's why the five stones of Medjugorje are so critical. So how many are going to confession? How many are going to adoration at X number of hours a week? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, frankly, not many. Yeah. Yeah, the so blueprint's right know. there for, for everyone to assimilate into their lives, no matter what's going on. I think Our Lady has really made that clear in all the places that she's been appearing, is um, if you the importance of faith and trust is measured by how much fear you really have. And also, it's also measured by how much love that you want to be closer to our Lord. And yeah, the five stones uh, you're, like you're talking about, um, and and in or the four parts of Fatima, you know, the adoration, reparation, consecration, and rose daily rosary. You can have every confidence that Our Lady is going to watch over you when she says, "My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God." Pray every single day in your family, especially the fathers make an explicit prayer, something that simple. I place my family in the refuge of your immaculate heart, protect them. And I think that that's part of the, one of the great wonders that we will begin to be, that we will see with greater clarity is how Our Lady will, against all of the, the machinations of the world and, and the way the world thinks that you, that 
her own will be protected because there's nowhere to run. There's no way to hide from the way that the, this international web of of Satan is right now. He's got he has it all connected, and so um, this Our Lady will. She always holds the trump card. No pun intended. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and we're not going to, and we're not, and I think the faster we realize, like, we have to play our roles, we have to do our civil duties, we have to, but we, we cannot vote out the evil that we are facing. And I think that that's a critical thing as we go forward. The devil, like Sheen says, he, the, the Antichrist and what, he, and the whole spirit of Antichrist that will lead up to him is that is making theology politics. And we have to be really careful not to fall for that because otherwise we're going to really set ourselves up i think for things worse th than they already are so well yeah i once did this thing um on adoration 24 hours in a day times seven days a week times i just did 30 days in a month some have 31 times 12 months and if i counted up and i gave the hours per I've got to tell you, and there are people that are daily communicants who don't go to adoration one hour a year. So, or, or ever even fast, where we're told that fasting can stop wars. You know, so we need to do what we can. And we love to place blame on others not doing their work. But the fact of the matter is we need to be more cognizant of what we need to be doing versus others. Yeah. Um, well, well said, Ted. Thank you so much for your time. I want uh, how how can our viewers, how can uh, th those who are watching this, find your book and get a copy of it? Um, they can go to sign.org. It just literally arrived today, um, and um, it's just been a pleasure to do this with somebody like yourself who knows this material so well, on from thirty thousand feet to the practicality <laughs> of everyday living and the messages of how they interconnect. It's been a joy to actually participate with you. But it's on sign.org and it's actually right now uh, greatly reduced. And um, it's right on the home page now. Right is right if nobody is right. Wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And believe me, in this error-infested world, what we really need is a church and an authority that is right not when the world is right, but one that is right when the world is wrong. Never in history has the prayer of the rosary been more needed to save our families, our countries, and defeat the evils of the world than now. The Fulton Sheen Institute worked closely with the Roma Rosary to develop the most unique, beautiful, and meaningful rosary that was inspired by Fulton Sheen's World Mission Rosary. This special handcrafted rosary continues Sheen's passion to support the mission of the church to evangelize the entire world. Each decade of the rosary has a different color, which corresponds with a different continent. Yellow for Asia, red for the Americas, white for Europe, blue for the nations of Oceania, and green for Africa. Each Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary comes with a set of four pure essential oil blends that have been chosen for their therapeutic and theological significance. These blends correspond to the four mysteries of the rosary. Simply choose the oil for the mystery of the day, drop a small drop in the palm of your hand, and massage the oil over the surface, being sure to catch the lava beads. You're good to go, and your prayer will linger longer with these beautiful, aromatic notes. Every Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary you purchase supports our mission to fight the battle for the hearts and souls of the Christian family and lead our world back to God. So visit the Fulton Sheen Institute's store and pick up your beautiful Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary today. Get one for you, your family members, and your close friends, and don't forget your pastor. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support.